Willem Bimbi, Warami Midiga, Warami Daruga Nura, Warami Walameda, Warami Wanura Walamedigo. We welcome you on behalf of the ancestors and we acknowledge all of the elders past and present. We acknowledge all Aboriginal nations of Australia. We walk together on this land and we pay respects to the traditional owners and those who have walked before us. We acknowledge the land's history, yesterday's, today's and tomorrow's. The land speaks of the Darug and their dreaming. We can still feel, hear and see the ancient song lines across this beautiful campus. This land has held many gatherings for centuries since the Darug's first sunrise some 60,000 years ago. We belong to the land. We are many nations, many people coming together, looking after this country and respecting each other. We stand here together at Macquarie on sacred ground. As the Wallamai navigate the mangroves and find their pathways, so shall you here at Macquarie. Warami, welcome to Wallamata Juju Goyanu. Welcome back to the Incubator and welcome to week three of the GO program for product development. Um, so a few of you last night at the workshop, so welcome back. Um, and anyone that didn't come last night, you're in really safe hands with Emma tonight. Um, so first things first is some housekeeping for the, you, those of you that don't know. Uh, ladies toilets are around to the left and the gents around to the right. Um, and as you may have noticed, we are filming the event. Um, so if anyone is uncomfortable being on camera, just let us know and we can move you to a spot in the room where you won't be filmed. Um, so I would now love to introduce you to Emma LaRosso, our speaker this evening. Emma is an international business leader, strategist, speaker and writer. She is CEO of um, Digivisor, Australia's leading social web analytic and activations technology company, which she co-founded in 2010 and she's also the CEO of Godot Games, a leading destination for all things gaming and esports, which she founded in 2012. So I know that we're leaving you in great hands, so I'd love to welcome Emma up to speak for you this evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, so thanks for being here tonight. Wow, that res looks pretty poor, but I am going to make a commitment to you to not be boring, so I will do my best on that. And I'm also going to try not to, oh, one little pet, kill you with lots of bullet points. So I think the best way people learn is to hear real life examples and then have the ability to ask um, questions. And I will be really honest in terms of the lessons that I've learnt along the way. So if I just set some um, context of, because you are in the week of taking a product to market, I have been involved originally in marketing, but very much um, in general management, and headed up as president and chief operating officer um, at ASX listed software company, Ultium, where we had about 80,000 customers, 97% um, of our revenues were earned overseas, and its market cap's about 2.5 billion. So I've learnt to take products to market and in that case that was taking it from what used to be um, you know, in a box and shipped to delivering online through um, continuous updates, which is the way software's gone. But while I was travelling around the world, I was seeing how much, particularly in developing countries, the constraints of being behind a desk in the way that people work were changing and everything was very mobile first. The plane would land wherever I was, um, whether it was China or... Um, India, everyone pulled out their smartphones and they were working and they were buying and they were connecting in you know, forums and uh, marketplaces that were obviously greater than the population of Australia. So that's kind of what really made me think about the opportunity and a space that I wanted to create the next company that I wanted to found, which was Digivisor. Um, and it was really about harnessing that digital footprint, people who were using their mobile phone to engage, like, share, buy, how could I solve the problems that businesses were looking always to solve, which was how could that data be used to help them acquire customers or cross-sell or retain or drive greater loyalty? Um, so that was the space that I wanted to start the company. So in terms of the context of where we play, and I just want to kind of give this as background, because part of what I want to share with you is that journey from how we've started 
um, which has kind of helped us fund but where we're actually heading now in terms of taking our product to market. But at its core, we want to help a business anywhere understand, deliver and make good decisions about their investment in digital marketing. So making meaning from all that data, and it is big data. <coughs> so we are leading, we're leading, we have had that validated multiple times, we're a strategic alliance partner of Deloitte, so they've um, validated the technology we've built is unique and what we offer on top of that. Um, we started in Sydney, um, we're now about 25-30% of our revenues are earned overseas. We're about 60 plus people. I've got 13 people in Asia already based there, even though we're serving elsewhere. And we have technology at our heart and services over the top. And we've been serving mostly the big end of um, the customer base, so enterprise customers. Um, so really lovely list of clients there. Um, and that's really helped us self-fund, we have since got funding along our journey, but it was really about learning what mattered um, when companies were trying to understand this changing customer. The, the marketing hadn't changed about get, trying to find and deliver the right message to the right person at the right time, but digital meant you could now do it in that context, intersect actually in real time, and that was the thing that we were able to help with. Um, so we're harnessing this data, uh, or this, uh, we're a development and ad partner to the major platforms. Um, with a product that sits underneath it, so product and engineering team, with an analytics team, the analytics team are really the ones that have created the algorithms and the, um, I guess, how to, how to, tr to transform or how to make meaning from that data and then the product and engineering team are about how can that be you know, productised in a way that, that is able to be served to, to every customer. And then we've had these services over the top to help brands um, do something with it. Now when I started Digivisor uh, nearly eight years ago now, I really just wanted to be a technology company thinking, having headed up a company, having my history in marketing, I would really value uh, having these insights of where customers were, what they cared about, what they talked about, what content they liked, what they, uh, who they followed, um, anything that I could learn about them in real time as opposed to research that would come six or 12 months after the fact. You know, a lot of um, you know, propensity models is so based on what's already happened, not what's happening now. So I was like, oh, everyone will love this, what I, what we, what I proposed. But I actually found the ecosystem was actually just very resistant to change. So while the client really wanted those same insights like I imagined they would, the advertising agencies, the PR agencies, the market research companies, they weren't ready to, to change their model. So they liked being able to come up with a big idea, say an agency, you know, maybe once, twice a year, big budgets, throw heaps of money at it and you know, maybe measure it two months after it had been delivered. That was their model. They weren't interested in how do they make meaning in real time and intersect. So ha having run agencies previously, I was like, I'll just add services over the top. Where we've got this huge customer demand saying, we want not just your insights and the ability to do this, we want you to add the creative and the services to help us go to market in this real time way, this way data driven marketing approach. Um, and to be honest, that was actually the thing that really grew Digivisor because we just overnight had a turnkey solution. Except that it's running a services business on top of a technology business, which means really it's, there's conflict there in terms of one, you're building one thing to get to as many people as possible and a services business is largely you know, bespoke, how do you just serve me? And the bigger the customer and the bigger the money they spend, the more demanding they are. Um, and in fact, you know, um, you know, your ability to make money out of that in terms of margins is a lot less than had, had we stayed with technology. But we, but we have done very well. I just want to kind of give you a sense of what that looks like. So our technology has been deployed in social command centres um, and people's... Um, you know, in big corporates that are trying to see in real time um, some understanding of their investment in digital from their assets that they own, so their social channels um, that they actually operate and what's happening, their influences that they might have engaged, their competitors, so what's their share of voice, etc. So they are able to have 
massive amounts of meaning um, from in real time that is very specific to their context that they can um, intersect and engage on. Then as more and more as the social platforms were going into um, paid media, so Facebook is largely today a pay to play platform, you have to pay to reach even those people that you've acquired yourself. We have then integrated paid media into our platform and that's been extremely valuable because it's not actually built into many platforms and it's certainly not available to many businesses to get a one view um, of your spend. So if I choose to do it in owned or I choose to do it in earned or I choose to do it in paid, how can I know what's working for me? How do I know what's working best? How do I know what my cost per lead or my cost per conversion is? How do I understand that? And so this question actually really um, is the one that we've been solving for the, for the last 12 months and we're at beta today. But it's really this, why should the best of technology be available to just the big companies that can afford it? Why can't we make that best of technology available to every business? And that's really the thing that's excited me in my working history and it's what really excites me for Digivisor is can we take the best of everything and make this available to small to, small to medium businesses who really are locked out of the best technology, the best insights, the best solution. So now this is what's driving us as a company to help all businesses better understand their digital investment, gain greater ROI and do that through a SaaS solution. So, oh, hang on, sorry guys. So when you're taking a product to market, whether it is enterprise or in this case where we're going into the mid-market, it's really important you have a very clear understanding of what the customer problem is that you're solving. And the more you can personalise that and relate and the more you can hear directly from your customer to this is the specific need, the specific requirement that they have or pain point or something that is, you know, um, preventing them to... To, to be the best that they want to be or the aspiration that they're getting to, the closer you understand that, the more likely you are um, to focus on solving that. So taking that problem, I wanted to talk to you about taking that product to market and, and the challenges of going from enterprise to something, you know, like say the enterprise technology is licensed in one instance at $15,000 a month and we're talking about taking that same technology simplified so it's very easy for non-technical founders or marketing people at $89 a month. So that's a massive shift in the way we've been thinking and the way that we can operate. But I can tell you the first thing in any business and this is you know, now, I don't know how, let me think how old I am in my career, but you know, 20, you know, 20, um, 27 years or so that I've been, been in, in business leadership is success of a business is always based on people and taking a product to market is no different. If you've got the right people, you'll be successful. So I just wanted to kind of set that context. So we hire and you can see we have a lot of fun, but it all starts with people. They must be smart, talented, get things done, infinite learners and not assholes. And we literally measure every one of our hires or our new potential hires on that, those characteristics. And we actually hold people accountable to that in our culture too. Like if you're just hard work, you don't last. If you can't be thrown at any problem or any situation and fast adapt um, to, to whatever is this new, then you won't survive. And we've had some amazing um, people kind of learning journeys in Digivisor where They've come in as with a kind of communications or psychology background and they're now coders and they've never coded in their life because they really just wanted to solve the, this, you know, this problem for these customers and they've just gone to, because they're smart enough, they're talented enough, they care about delivering and so they just go to where they can add the most value in the company. That's really important about who you hire and, um, and make sure that they care and, and carry that culture. So the, the top right one saying Happy Australia Day, that's the team in Asia. Um, we've got someone in 13 different countries so they don't actually work together in one office. So the culture that we built for Digivisor in Sydney, how do we take that overseas and make sure that that 
foundation is going to, to grow in the same way with the same values that we care about. Um, and that's, that's a strategy too. It's how you ship your best people to, to forge the new territory. It's you know, making sure you're sharing people backwards and forwards so they're learning from you and you learn from them uh, and you make it very much, um, technology makes it very easy actually to bring people in. So the way you, you learn, you teach, you share in terms of um, you know, Facebook Live or Skype, etc. So about our values. There's our team in um, Singapore and Malaysia there, but we're one team. We create better outcomes. We are genuine, we are fearless, we take responsibility, we improve every day. If you don't have core values even in your company before you even take your product to market, you won't actually create the culture of success. So a lot of people start, and I've, you know, I can remember going to, you know, listening to founders, you know, 20 years ago and, you know, it was all kind of pricing and, you know, what were the freemium models and all sorts of stuff like that. And I can talk to all of that if anyone has those questions. I've got to tell you, if I had to say the most <laughs> critical thing is to uh, product success is get your people right, get your values right, make sure you understand the problem that you're solving um, really, really, really well um, so, and having everyone behind that, that will help you be successful. And I think, you know, from a product strategy, then it's like, how do you make sure that your problem is big enough that there's going to be a market behind it and that you're going to have enough learning. If it's too simple, then someone else will solve it, including the person or the, the, you know, the people who are doing it themselves. But if it's a big enough problem, then you will find your, your um, market to be able to not just build and test in, but, but to grow. Um, you want it to be in a growing market. So the earlier you can be somewhere, the greater it is. We went very early, eight years ago. The, I mean, literally, those companies on that those logo list, my first meetings with those companies was actually answering what was social, let alone here we had this whole platform being able to help them understand and you know, um, action all that data. They were like, why should I do social? It's completely opposite. Now I'll be asked to go talk to boards saying how do we actually you know, transform our whole organisation's thinking to take advantage of, you know, live customer data and intersecting and how do we know? So it's completely different. So the earlier you are in a growing problem space, the better it is in terms of your chance of success. Um, you want to have an extendable brand presence. So how can you fix what you solve so that it does continue to evolve um, as the market changes and technology changes and you grow as well um, and that you make it different enough to make it defensible um, and so the the perfect oh, very trigger happy this little thing um, so the perfect kind of product market fit is when you really understand that prom problem and that the context and there's a true need and that you have a product that has a real customer like like someone and lots of people that you know that fit that, that sees value in what you're doing. And where you intersect those things, that's where you win. And it seems really simple, but it actually, it actually is just, you have to be really disciplined in testing those points. Now I had a, a, a company come in to see me not that long ago who presented, I think actually what could be a very good product, they certainly had a lot of knowledge, they'd done a lot of research, they were probably in the right space, they had good intent, but they just hadn't articulated enough who the customer was, why they would value it, and how they were going to solve it so that that customer saw that that, that was just not concrete enough. So, it, it, like, you know, my, my, my recommendation and where I spent time was not actually in helping them think about marketing or going to market, it was like, how can I help you actually get tight around these things to, to ensure your success. Um, so it seems simple, but it's actually a discipline. You've got to literally answer those equations. The other thing which is really lovely in this world of technology and in SaaS and your thinking um, is that, and, and any delivery through technology platform, is that you can continuously test your hypothesis with customers. So in the past, and particularly like you know, history for me, when it was you had to create a product that would ship in a disc and you know, would be shipped physically, 
you didn't have as much data around whether the changes you were making were actually going to be the things that were going to be valued and used in the way that you intended, um, or just the feedback loop, so how that customer did think about that or use it or, the, or how much they rated the, the impact to them on making or solving their problem. Like you didn't have that loop, but today that's really, really um, probably one of the best things in the environment that we're in is that we can ship immediately and get immediate feedback and know because you can measure that, um, you know, through, you know, through t through tech tools that show you where your customers and what they're using and and what they're doing in your product. But you can also be asking them. But you've got that means to continuously iteratively do it. On the way here, um, I was listening to a podcast and it was Daniel Petri and he was talking about it was only about um, you know, seven, eight years ago where a startup had to have pretty well in their view $5 million in the bank to be successful. And now they look at it as you could be successful with $80,000 in the bank because of technology making it possible to be able to test and ship and continuously iterate. So that just gives you that kind of order of magnitude. I thought that was an interesting perspective on, on the point that I was making. So as you grow, so as I said, we're at 60 today. Um, when we started, we were in an office in Manly and we got up to eight people and then we moved to an office in George Street and we got up to about 12 people or 15 people and then we moved to our next office and we got up to about 25 people. In all those instances, it was still pretty easy to be able to talk to, to someone every day about what it was that we were doing. Um, we, we followed Agile methodology. It was very easy to be able to hear and listen and iterate and catch up where things were and solve the problems that were being caught out. But even at, at our size today, at 65, like it's not possible to do that. There has to be a lot of discipline. And because we're also in other countries and because we've got this you know, um, dual model actually happening at the moment between enterprise and um, through our SaaS product, we actually have to be really super focused. So um, about 18 months ago, uh, I read the book Radical Focus. Um, so it's a book I would recommend. But it talks about OKRs, objective and key results. And if you can set that for your organisation so you have no more than three objectives for your business at any one time and the key results, like how you're going to measure whether you were successful in achieving that objective and roll that through your organisation, you won't find that same focus and, and it becomes this common like dialogue in the organisation. Everyone knows, we talk to it, we roll it down and it does allow us to, to provide focus. And at the time where we actually made a really you know, um, big decision, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of those decisions along the way a bit further along, it was actually the OKRs that provided the razor focus of if it wasn't on this, we don't do it. If someone was trying to create time or meetings around something that wasn't in the OK, like we just didn't do it. And it actually was the, I guess, the parameters or the, the, the discipline or the language and the language, I think, in the organisation to give people the confidence of what, what everyone should have been focused on. So I do um, encourage that. The other way I say it nearly in every meeting is plan, 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 then execute. But it is this absolute strong need to be focused um, on the things that matter, on the measures that are going to prove that you're actually getting to where you need to. Um, you know, effort is not outcome. Um, businesses do not survive because we all had a good time and tried our hardest. You know, they're successful taking a product to market, you'll be successful if you have that razor focus and you're measuring and targeting the things that are going to drive your greatest success. And you have to think hard. You might not always get it right, and maybe you don't get 100% of the way there, but it, but it provides that, that focus for people to, to know what they need to do. Oh. So as I said, so for us, it's, it's taking this much bigger you know, um, heavier um, product to something that's much lighter and easy to pl deploy and doesn't need expertise and, and knowledge to do that. But it's actually changing our whole business model too. So instead of being able to, you know, quote up front and have something that's easy, to, easily kind of invoiceable, we use Zero as our 
accounting platform. This is built in, into SAS, so it's all online and, and very easy and simple and requires us to deliver value because there's no contract. You, you use the product and um, if you don't get value, you don't pay and you stop using it. So, you know, it's very important we get it right. So, you know, the subscription-based billing is not contracts. It's not, um, it's not um, contract renewals. It's just this commitment that you have access to the best of our technology each month. Um, so that's what SaaS basically is around. Um, and the way that you price it is obviously you're trying to put the best of your technology, so this more for less for more, so more features for less dollars to reach more people. And a lot of people get pricing wrong because they think that, you know, it's not about putting the best features in so you don't actually hook people enough, uh, they don't get enough value out of it so they're not going to to upsell or they're not going to continue to spend. And equally, if you make it too cheap, then you might either not make money um, or they won't value it either. So you've got to find that point where it's enough that they want to get value out of it, but you've delivered far more value in it. Um, and you know that's when they'll start sharing, talking, using, um, you know, asking other people uh, to join them in, in that solution. It also means the types of KPIs that you're um, focused on are very different um, and in fact they can be quite, we're not at that point yet but I have been in other organisations where we'll even fixate on certain performance things on site. Um, what's going to drive a greater conversion? At this point we're just like where are we in the number of customers and our cost per acquisition and um, what's the monthly recurring revenue? How is what we're building because it's still relatively new in this model. We've got this heavy, you know, kind of, you know, it's big data and big, um, big development costs and big infrastructure that was easy to share through big clients. But, you know, how do we get this model right that we, we've got this value pricing data um, at a point that, that's going to um, make sure that we, we win long term? Um, lifetime value of a customer and your revenue churn, your retention. So how long are you keeping your customers on the platform? So very different measures and um, they're, they're applicable. They'd be applicable to anyone in this room. Um, I think they're, they're as relevant to a big company. Uh, big, big software is smaller, but you just focus much tighter on these and obviously the numbers you're trying to hit are much greater. I don't know if anyone's seen this before. I've had this on my wall now for pretty well 20 years, but it actually, it's, it, when I was thinking about this from a product perspective, it's like, it's so true, like communication and taking the time to, again, really identify like what's the value impact you're looking for in any point of work that you're doing or any part of product design or build. What is it that you're trying to do because of this big gap between what a customer is looking for and then how people talk about it and then what you imagine you're going to be paid for it and this completely, you know, miss, miss, match all the way through. So it's absolutely critical that you minimise that from what the customer wanted and what you, you uh, are trying to build and where you're getting to, um, to, to what they really needed. It is, it is the language of you know, what is, what's that problem? What's the value impact that they're looking for? How tight can you make it so what you do truly does solve it? That you don't do a lot of lots of things and actually not really solve anything, you know? Um, you start to build the, the Big Dipper, um, but it's actually doesn't, it's not what the customer wants. So it's really important that you, you get that planning and that focus. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, another, th another thing that I've seen change over time is this, you know, in, in bigger, like I had, I don't know, maybe 250, 300 engineers at Altium, there was a lot more discussion when we had a bit more time to ship product as opposed to this ability to continuously test around what we thought was going to be the greatest value, what we would be focused on. And it can be partially, you know, and, and easily influenced by the bigger opinion, pe you know, people who've got the weight uh, able to argue and, you know, those with the largest voice or the most senior position may have won in those. This is very different in, in this world that we're in 
today and your ability to test is that you can be very experiment driven in the way that you think. You can, you, you still make those decisions based on customer and you know your own research and input, but you test it as early as you can in terms of putting it into the hands of your customers and to get their feedback. The other thing which you do differently from you know the big customer to the smaller customer is, um, sorry, the big enterprise to a small to medium where you've got these different um, pricing points. You can't service them, so we're actually learning that culture of not every customer is going to be handheld. We want to listen very much in the early days to those that are using the new product, but you know you could afford to have people support in a um, larger kind of enterprise software solution. You can't afford to do that. So just setting simple rules like if you're going to support something, you can only write something once. Like it has to exist for many. So solve what you're solving for every customer, not just one. And just that type of thinking starts to be very, very different um, in the way that you need to think about it. Um, I actually really like this. Uh, it was shared with me, uh, I, I don't even know who the original author is, but how technology mirrors culture and I mean I, I, I think this is quite interesting because the more you read about those cultures of the organisation, the more you see it actually reflected in their product, their product suite and their product delivery. Um, so it's an interesting thing to think about when you're thinking about whatever the product that you're taking to market or you're building um, or creating or your company today is like, What's, what is it that you're trying to do and how well does your culture support that in the way that you make decisions or think or uh, hierarchically place? So, um, anyhow, I just thought that was kind of kind of cool. Um, we're probably following more the Spotify model. I'm not sure if anyone's seen this, where we want to, because we've hired really smart people, so I, I've got this um, view that the more bureaucracy you have, the more likely you've lowered your bar on talent and smarts. So if you're telling people what to do, there's a problem, right? You hide wrong, right? You need to keep coming back to what problem do you want solved and have you got the smartest people to be able to do that? And that's how do you make sure they've got high alignment and high autonomy to what it is that you're trying to solve so that you can build faster, get to market faster, have people care and debate what's the right thing by the customer, not what was the thing I was told to do, right? There's a real difference in what you get out of the same cap human capital by thinking about that culture and the way that you empower them. And so even in our tiny team, I think we're pretty tiny with the ambitions and the customers that we have today, we'll work on um, like, product thread so there'll be a, a team and I'll have a designer and some engineers and they'll own a certain part of the product and they'll be looking to solve a certain um, you know, customer problem but it's up to them to go through the process of engaging the right people and to do that testing and making that happen. And there's points obviously that needs to connect and you know sometimes you know, the API team or the infrastructure need, need to, to know what's going on so everyone's working to the same purpose. But the, we can get more done if you can kind of build this type of culture as opposed to everyone waits till I say it or the manager says it or it's, you know, fragmented or uh, in conflict. So, um, so other lessons uh, in learn and doing this switch is what got us here won't get us there and it's quite painful when you, when you, I've had so many different, including from um, potential investors and VCs say, I could stay on the enterprise route, you know, what, what we've built is enough and if we just focus on that then that's quite a powerful and valuable business. But it's actually not what I want to do. And I don't think that's going to be anywhere near the, like, um, the size or scale of value that I think we can be delivering. Um, it's not what I've set, set out to do as a company. But it also means the type of thinking or people that might have been um, and the way that we worked and even at the customers um, that we had at 
to get us to where we are today, they're not necessarily the ones we want for tomorrow because they just can't make that transition. And, and the earlier you recognise that, the, the greater your chance of success is. So, because time is opportunity cost, obviously if you've got people who can't make that transition, they're holding the seat for someone great who can take you to that next place. You can have experience um, that you need that you don't have because your model of old isn't the model that you, you need to go to market next. Um, it's, it's quite um, raw and it's quite brutal and it's quite, I think, um, taxing, but it's actually probably the biggest lesson that I've learnt. And, um, the biggest one for me that I had to change over was actually uh, uh, the guy that I, it was our third employee who headed up our technology. Um, and he did an, an amazing job for us for probably five years. Um, when you have no money and you're building in low cost and you build everything yourself and, um, and it's a tight and small team. But that was not the type of thing we needed to get to scale and to build the type of product that we're building today and recognising that and making sure that you make that decision where everyone leaves on good terms, but you don't make the mistake of not getting to where you need to get to because you haven't got the right skill or mindset or you know, core capability and alignment in your business. So um, it's, it's just something to just keep at the back of your mind. For me, it was real, I went to a a conference and actually it was, a, it was, an, it was um, Mike Cannon Brooks who was talking about one of his lessons and he said if there was one thing he could do differently it would have been making a decision around a key hire that they'd made that got them to, to where they'd got to to a certain point in their growth and they were hanging on, hanging on and when they finally made the decision recognising this person wasn't right, all the, the talent and value that was sitting behind that person was allowed to rise to the top and they just went leaps and bounds. It's like if he had his time again, he would have made that decision. It kind of coincided for me right at that point where I'm going, this is starting to be a real barrier to our growth. You know, don't make the mistake because of what got you here and the success that you've achieved to date. Is that enough? It's like some, it's not. So that's, it's, it's tough and it's emotional, but you need to do it. The other thing too is, um, you know, burning the boats and bridges. Um, I mean, the, the whole thinking behind that and, you know, you. Again, if you've got the right people in your company, they don't mind doing this. It's still scary. It's really scary to say, here's all our success today that's been built on this enterprise solution and this is what it looks like and look at all our happy and great referring big clients and it's really exciting and everyone gets excited about it to say it's not actually where we see our future. And in fact, we're going to put these really hard through our OKRs and through resources. We're actually going to really change our focus and we're going to burn that bridge or burn the boats to make this decision give us our best chance of success. Um, so it does, it terrifies people, but you can't be both. You can't be half pregnant. You can't, you know, be almost there or get 80% right or, you know, um, an expression I love is the, you know, the operation was successful but the patient died. You can be really, really good at doing stuff, but if you haven't truly got the heart and the, the passion the, and everything to make something live, then you're just not going to, to be able to do that. And so being prepared to do this is really, really important because most, most of us always, and I've never met someone even when they're really successful, um, will say they're nowhere near where they believe they can still take their company or how much greater they see the opportunity. There's always something more you could be doing. So while you're limited where you are in your thinking to something you might have decided, you know, maybe six weeks ago, but most likely six months ago or six years ago, that's not what, what, you know, what you're doing then. You need to be prepared to kind of break and break really, really enough to not allow you to go back to the safe ground or others to go back to safe ground to what they do if you want to back what you see as a future. So just in terms of where we are, I will tell you we haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We've made some serious bridge burning and boat burning, but we've actually limited our enterprise, and I hope none of my customers are in the room, but no more than one person, half a person per week can work on our enterprise um, technology. We are maintaining that um, to keep the revenue and because it is paying for the development of our new um, product. So we didn't say no, we don't want your money, 
but we are not selling on our old technology at all. Any client coming in is on the new technology. That's how we demo. That's how we deliver all the analytics. Everything that we've built around is now the new technology. Even though some of it is stuff we're still building, it's in the enterprise. It'll show up in the in the this lighter product. But the 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 point is to not throw out the thing that's keeping the lights on and paying people, but giving us our best chance of success moving forward. And I imagine actually we'll be able to migrate our larger clients over onto the new solution. But Right now, I'm happy to take. While the product's working enough, um, we'll stay. We'll stay with both models. And you know, it gives me actually just on that. It gives me also the option of potentially selling another part of the business, so I can actually break the business into two halves. Um, I haven't talked about GoToGame Game tonight at all, but that's a separate business because it's been born out of the insights, the growing gaming and esports space. But because it feels so different to our core business, it is its own business with its own OKRs and its own mandate. Again, because it's got an opportunity to do best, it didn't make sense to be in Digivisor anymore because it was too in conflict with what we were trying to solve, even though it was born out of the insights that we discovered. And even though some of our big clients cross over both, it has its own mandate, its own product vision, its own um, you know, market, uh, value and proposition that it's chasing. So we're not, we're not compromising what we're focused on. So now instead of thinking of you know, the top ASX 200 customers, we're looking at you know, these 255,000 Australian businesses that sit in this perfect sweet spot for us, what they're spending, what they, that can represent to us, what that really means, because to me, what we've built is not to be an Australian um, solution business. It's just that obviously we've got brand recognition, great referral um, here, so we can be learning, uh, learning here. But what we build is completely scalable, and anyone, even today, from any country, can be taking advantage of it. So, and even looking at some of our beta customers, they're there. We haven't marketed overseas, but they found us. So. Being quite specific about who we're chasing, the size of the company, the personas of who we're selling to, it's really important we stay that focus so that we know who we're, we're marketing to, but it actually makes you think very differently. So um, I was like, oh, should I put the little bubble here of the number of customers in the enterprise versus what you start to think when you open it up? But it's, it's a good exercise and you'll see those slides often in investor decks of you know, getting that thinking between What's your immediate focus? What's your kind of, you know, um, you know, two, 18 month to, to sort of three year focus and what's your you know, focus beyond that? Because if you can think globally right from the outset, you, you, you're building something that truly will have that, that growth um, and interest of investors. And this is where we take what we have from enterprise and we make sure that it's the thing that helps us in have our greatest um, success or our competitive advantage in this new kind of uh, part of the business. So we, we know we are very strong in using insights for content lend digital marketing. So we, we, we sell that, we do that for all these big companies. We know we can do that for ourselves and we're using those same insights um, and bringing those same insights into the product. Um, one of the things that has meant I've seen companies come in and out trying to start business around all this social and search data. It's big data. It's massive amounts of continuous change on the platform APIs. Nothing is consistent. They don't want things to be consistent. They don't want people to make it easy to compare. They want to create, you know, Google doesn't want to share with Facebook and vice versa. But we can do that by normalising it. But it's big data. So we've actually got quite a defendable position because we have built all this and have for the last eight years. We've done a lot of proprietary modelling and IP um, development and algorithms and machine learning that can apply into the new product that we've taken from one into the new. So again, that's quite defendable. We're not really like a, a startup, even though we are a startup within our own business, although we're you know, not, not far out of the startup in our first business. Um, we've got great referral customers, so you know if we were just starting from scratch and saying you know here's Jim from, I'll say Jim Jim Mowers because it came to mind, but 
you know, versus this is the same technology that any one of those big brands are using that's now available to you. We've got this great reference point that make, means that it's defendable. Um, and then that ability, that global mindset, global experience. The reason why I put that up there is to have to suggest um, and encourage you to think about what's, defend, what's your defendable space, what's your competitive advantage, you know, what's your forces that prevent someone just coming in and, and being able to either copy or mimic you see that happen a lot. There's not a lot of evidence that number one in market wins. Often it's number two that comes behind number one where number one's kind of taken all the pain of creating, you know, the mindset that, that you know, he's, he's a new category um, and number two does it better. So you've got to be thinking continuously. Can I do this better? Can I keep disrupting myself? Is this defendable? How hard is it for someone to come behind me? How long is my window in front of me? Um, to, to give you every chance of success. So this is just to give you a sense of, you know, that big kind of heavy, it's, it's nice and it's light and you can see very easily at a glance how each of your campaigns are performing, your costs, um, so impressions, engagements, views, click-throughs, um, conversions, dollar spent, etc. cetera, um, with, ooh, with insights that are able to just be alerted to people who are not technical just through a push button, I connect my social, I connect my search accounts, all this data just pulls in and now you have the ability to see what's actually going on. Now if you're spending, and a lot of startups, especially funded startups, they can be spending you know, you know, 20 to 50K a month. If you're an e-commerce platform on digital, like would you spend $89 to know exactly what's going on when you can't do it through any other tool and someone's got to spend two, to four hours a day to kind of pull reports together to get someone to make it a sit like to have this it's really valuable so and of course like I said we listen to customer feedback all the time what what's their problem what questions are they asking what questions are we trying to solve and are we solving them so that continuous loop that's actually there so I hope we're successful in taking this market uh, this product to market um, like there's you know, it's hard, <laughs> um, but you know, I think if you keep thinking along those lines, you have every chance of success. So, um, and certainly, you know, we're, we're doing well, we're still in the game, um, we're still growing, um, we're in different countries, we've got a lot of interest, so it's, it's a really interesting time. I, I hope we'll, we'll be able to do it. I certainly feel like I've got a lot of um, learnings and lessons along the way and I'm very happy to answer any of your questions if you've got anything specific to like now you've heard this journey like what what questions would you have um, could I help you and I think I'm going to throw this microphone to you so what sort of problems or questions are people thinking about in terms of taking their own product to market So I think, I mean, the first thing was, I guess I came out, my background was in, thank you, was in marketing. Um, and as, as C, you know, as the President Chief Operating Officer, like all the board cared about was how many customers were we acquiring and what value were we getting out of them. So I knew that was the problem that I wanted to solve. I knew what people in those roles were thinking about. So that's where we started the, and, and of course, this opportunity of it was pretty uncharted. It was kind of like the Wild West. It was all this data had been unharnessed and I thought I had the, the best chance of, you know, coming from technology, knowing how to build a product in a space, selling to C-level and CMOs. So that's kind of where the company started. And then now my thinking is, well, every business is trying to do that. You can't really be like the customer, like it doesn't matter where you are in business or if you're B2B or B2C, your customer is on their mobile. That's where they are. And they're expecting First of all, like they want lots and lots of content. It's infotainment. You can't bore them. You know, they want to learn and have give you permission to for you to take them on a journey to whatever it is that you're hoping that they're going to do for you. And so this need to kind of to understand what's going on, where they are, what they care about, what content's working, um, that becomes really critical. So it was taking all that thinking where 
sea level and CMOs in big companies, that's every business. So that's what the, the product is today in solving that problem. But we keep them really top of mind. So like, um, you know, talking a lot to small to medium businesses, especially now we've found this kind of really nice sweet spot in funded startups, um, e-commerce companies, they're spending money, everything's to drive outcome, they really want to know what's working, so we know who we need to talk to, what problems we need to solve, because we've got them really top of mind in our thinking. So we use Slack, um, love Slack. Uh, we use Google Docs, so that's how we collaborate, so everything's available to everyone. Um, we use Facebook um, groups, so we've got our own Digiverse. We do Facebook uh, live video, so every Friday we celebrate the wins for the week. We do a product update so everyone gets to see. Um, we we try and be very mindful around time, so you know time zones and time and sharing that load. Um, but Slack's been probably the best, so we've got that ordered by customer, by team function, and then by a whole bunch of things that like whether it's product feedback or um, support or like you know different areas, and that that helps kind of make it very easy for people to get very quick answers. Uh, and feel like they're still part of it, and then we just try and make sure we do as much live stuff as we can around that, and you know, one central kind of communication space. Second question: mm. Is that, is that um, the same way that you um, address the culture, your, your, your business culture, to all those teams? Look, we do all sorts of things. I mean, I, like so, the over like I'll be in Singapore again next week to meet the team. Um, face to face is is important. We do our own hackathons, like our own company hackathons. Innovation's been born out of that that we put back into the product. Anyone can do it. Um, we pulse check everyone's feelings. They can input into the things that they think we can be doing better. Um, what's what what what's going to help us get to market? Part? Like so so the as much own, as much empowerment and confidence and psychological safety to raise. Like if people really care about what you're trying to do and they've got a voice and they're being heard and we make enough, you know, of that, like value that input and make enough changes, then they'll keep doing it. So I think all, all that confidence and because we, we check that that confidence is there, um, there's no question that can't be answered. I share everything in terms of financial, like there's no secrets because I think that, you know, trust and transparency is key to it. But if you've hired the right people and you've really spent that time to articulate your vision and where you're going. Um, you can't ever say that enough, by the way, like the more, like just constantly, like what decisions are you making against those things so that people can learn to be thinking in that same way? Would this solve this problem? Is this the, you know, the, the key thing we're focused on? How do we do X? Then that creates that extra confidence and empowerment, I think, in the team. Oh, I, I get to throw it. Yeah. So apparently, is it true I can throw it? <laughs> so I hope you can catch. I won't be able to on the way back, so I shall put that down. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any unique ways of retaining talent? Uh, I, so first of all, I think there is no way you can retain talent if they don't truly believe and love what they do. Um, we offer a massive amount of flexibility, so it's a really, it's a confidence I've built over time. I've been doing leadership for a long time, but really being outcomes focused. So as long as people are getting shit done, um, I don't care where they do it from, I don't care what time they come in, um, I'm, I'm grateful if they because something bigs on that they work the night, the weekend, but then we try and make sure that that gets always given back. Um, we have a thanks channel in our Slack. We call out people's thanks, wins for the week. We have number one in the Digiverse that's peer voted. Um, like it's not one thing, it's, it's truly valuing, you know, people say people are the heart of their business. I don't see many cultures where that truly um, lives in every decision and the way that they think. I, I, I genuinely believe that's true and I really try to make that to what I do, but I also try and hire really awesome people that 
that that want that to be and protect that kind of you know this is the place they want to be these are our values this is what we care about anyone can say anything good ideas can come from anywhere you know that you know um, we care about you know what what we're delivering not not who's deli like it's 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 a very much all those things because we haven't been able to do it through money, I can tell you that. We do, do not pay best money, but we try and create the best culture, best learning, all these other things that people go, well, this is all. I feel like I'm, I'm driving success. Um, so we, because we're digital and social, uh, I'm very proud of the fact, I probably get no word of a lie, five recruiters a day trying to contact. Uh, me. Um, we've in, say, if we've got 65 people, maybe we've had, I don't know, 75, 80 people positions in time that we've appointed, if you allow for a bit of churn. Five have come through recruiters, the rest have been direct. We use LinkedIn, we use social, we make sure that our culture and our celebration of people and what we're focused on, um, we keep telling that story so that people see that and then say, when we do put an ad out, and people are digital, so they will look on LinkedIn. Um, if it's creative, you might put it on pedestrian, um, but mostly it's just social and our networks do the rest. Uh, and they're proud, they want to they want to invite their friends, someone that they've worked with previously. Um, yeah, so. Cool, thank you. You want to chuck it that way? Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, that's an interesting question. So I would say we were, we were delivering on day one. So, um, I mean, it's a really interesting thing if I talk about, because enterprise and the, the new product is slightly different in terms of the journey. But on the enterprise side, uh, I felt one of the things I could do that other companies couldn't do. So at the same startup, there were lots of startups trying to find solutions in social but they were very developer driven and I was like, well, I know how to, I know how to sell to C, 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 you know, C level. I'll just sell and then I'll just pre-sell and then I'll, I'll build it. Um, and one of our first customers was, was biggest telco. Um, now they had no idea we hadn't built it. I've definitely bluffed that one. Now the problem with doing, like doing that one was then I couldn't be on market to pitch into um, angel or you know any kind of funding because I'd have to publicly say we didn't we didn't have any money and we didn't have any people um, so, so it was literally customer funded from the start we just took this view that we would never build anything that wasn't for everyone so whatever that whatever got pre-sold had to be something that we was part of our vision and the product vision to be able to kind of build I would say it took us in truth about three years before anyone could access it and take without you know lots of hand holding along the way. Um, we're at a point now where the new product, I would say it's been um, so it's, you know, 12 months of this product's build, but it's obviously harnessing a lot of the stuff that we've built over the last seven years. Um, but to get it to, into the hands of customers, it took a good nine months and you know we're still in early days. We're not, we certainly haven't gone mass on this at by any stretch. So it's still you know still it's unproven, but we're just getting more and more customers onto it to, to learn as much. So when we do go big, um, we, we've got something that really will hold up. If you throw behind you, <laughs> I've never seen this before. I think it's cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's a it's a bit of both. Like, I mean, there's actually some science behind in terms of what we think our cost of acquisition and speed to market and what that would look like, which would represent that. The actual models that we've built have tolerances built. What if it was one percent? What what if it was? You know, something else, um, but it, it feels it feels achievable. Um, so I think it could be more aggressive as well. 
Um, but I think it's, yeah. Oh, look, and, the, and it, but see, when you say that, the first thing would be, but you could do better. But I'd much prefer someone pushes me than me to have something false um, that you can't achieve. And that's actually just in terms of funding, because along the journey, we did get funding to, to build this product. Um, was that because I feel, um, and having learnt, and because in an ASX listed company, we did a lot of acquisitions over that time, the key thing people look for is, can they trust that what you say, you will do? You know, that your assessment, your people, your knowledge of a market, the time that you say it's gonna take, like, can they actually trust? Because there's so many people out there who think the world, it's actually, I mean, it's hard. How, how many companies fail, right? So, um, so I've been really careful to stay on the, like, the safer side um, so even now I feel like I could have raised money, you know, and you do, oh, maybe I should have raised more then and give more of the company away and, you know, we'd have more cash in the bank now and there's all these maybe coulda, woulda, um, but the reality is I, I don't want to ask for money till we've got ourselves to the next point because I know the valuation would be so much greater and we've been able to prove ourselves to this point, but I'm taking a whole bunch on the journey and the interest is getting greater, so I'm hoping at that point it's, it's a slam dunk. And I've done it before, so I think it's right. I mean, you don't know until it is. Um, I hope the market doesn't fall out and all the unknowns that could happen. But I do know that, that being more conservative and proving um, what you said you were going to do and actually doing that or exceeding it is, and taking people on a couple of those milestones, their confidence is so much greater. I think it's someone behind me. Yeah. Sorry. I just want to pick up on yeah. Um, yeah. Um, select customers to work with in order to make sure that maybe you've got a clever on the proof point because there's a bit of an art in there. But yeah. It, well, you don't want to say no to somebody who ultimately is going to pay a bill. You also want to make sure that you've got the best part of the right people. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's happened over time, so first of all, I mean, I, Maybe at the start of Digivisor, I had a lot of credibility, and you see companies who do really well, they'll have a lot of credibility because, and in fact, if you ever pitch, make sure you always start with, you are the person that you are trying to solve the problem for. This was your problem. This wasn't being solved from anyone else. You know, The more you can make that your thing, the greater the expertise and knowledge you demonstrate in terms of that point back. So I think being able to really talk to it's not what you're asking for, this is what you actually need and here's why and how and here's the way that we can do that. So what, what would be that, what are you chasing for your first? And then you just work to make that happen without over-promising in that time, but you try and take it out of those specific. Now that might be very different from a commitment we make internally or you know, what we might make to a potential investor, that might be slightly different and then we'll still try and be conservative on, on what that is, but it'll be more about, um, like nothing's changed for us. The market's still big, it continues to grow, people spend more and more money, no one's solving this thing because all the big companies just don't make it affordable to every business. Yeah, like all the, those factors, they're, they're still there, so we've just got to be the one that gets out first um, with as much market share, so. But yeah, it's, it's, it is an, I agree, it's an art. In terms of who we bring on the journey from early beta, you bring your friendlies on first, people who know that you're gonna be good at what you do and they're part of solving that, so they're kind of shoulder to shoulder. I love that expression. Um, you know, we're in this shoulder to shoulder, how can we work together, we're on the same side working together. Even that just as a mental uh, model for yourself, like it just changes everything. We're not here to take money or bleed someone or lie or, win, you know, the best win is win, 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 right? The customer wins, your partner wins, you win, so. That's it? Oh, okay, I'm so glad I don't have to catch. Oh, well done. Well done. <laughs> So, I th so the first thing I would, um, I would make sure, so personally, I put money into the other bits, into the original business, 
Um, I'm putting money into this product so I can make sure that there's enough uh, runway to do it properly, um, get customers involved and on it as early as possible. Um, that focus, you know, some of those themes, um, I mean, they might look like words on, it's, like, it's kind of like, I, even when I wrote it, it's like, how do you bring all this into something that's really, but it actually is all true. That, so if you can do one thing really, really well that's really valuable, it's much easier to iterate off the back of it. So that's like, make sure you're, what you set in the real, you know, the being realistic about what you can deliver in time. The other thing is, even the world's best engineers, the world's best, and I feel like I've been lucky enough to work, work with the world's best. Whatever they say, it'll take them three times longer, without fail. There's just, there's just the way it is. Partially it's because they underestimate, partially it's because you're in new areas and so no one really knows, that's so still an estimate. And the other thing is you learn along the way, so what you think isn't actually, you need a little bit more time to get that right. So even just building those types of thinking in to it and just making sure you don't run out of money. I would say, if I had to say one of the things I had to do really, really, really well, and in corporate, someone else did this for me, um, was managing cash. And I feel like every day I'm managing cash still. And then I've spoken to companies who are really big and the founders, and I'm like, oh, you know, at what point did you stop worrying about money? And they're like, never. <laughs> so. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you so much for listening to, I hope you got something out of it, so. You guys, can you please um, join me in another big round of applause oh. for Emma? Yeah, that wasn't big enough before. <laughs>